every once in a while, archaeologists, and sometimes amateur archaeologists, make remarkable and bizarre discoveries. Sometimes the finding is so surprising that they're unable to explain what it is they found, how it came into existence, or ascertain its value. An out-of-place artifact is an artifact of historical, archaeological, or paleontological interest found in an unusual context, which challenges conventional historical chronology by its presence in that context. Such artifacts may appear too advanced for the technology known to have existed at that time, or may suggest human presence at a time before humans are known to have existed. Other examples may suggest contact between different cultures that is hard to account for with conventional historical understanding. We will explore these artifacts and allow you to determine what you think they are, their purpose, and who made them. Supporters regard these artifacts as evidence that mainstream science is overlooking huge areas of knowledge, either willfully or through ignorance. Many writers or researchers who question conventional views of human history have used purported artifacts to attempt to bolster their arguments. Creation science often relies on anomalous finds in the archaeological record to challenge scientific chronologies and models of human evolution. These artifacts have been used to support religious descriptions of prehistory, ancient astronaut theories, and the notion of vanished civilizations that possessed knowledge or technology more advanced than that known in modern times. One such artifact that has gained mainstream attention is the Antikytherian device. It is now known it is a clock, an astronomical computer. It was found in a shipwreck off Greece, so its exact age is unknown, but we know it is very old. The device is very complicated and has cogs that turn precisely to track the sun and planets including planets that were not known to exist in antiquity. Yet someone made this, crafted it together, and designed it to be very accurate. Modern reproduction models of this device are very precise. Who made this? How old is it? Where was it used and by whom? It's one of the many questions historians tackle as they study it. So far, archaeologists and science is baffled. Located at an altitude of approximately 1,170 meters is the Bakwek Valley Baalbek it's known to have been settled from at least 700 BC with almost continual settlement of the Tell under the Temple of Jupiter, which was a temple since the pre-Hellenistic era. However, some researchers such as Graham Hancock argue that its roots go back as far as 12,000 years. During the period of the Roman rule, Baalbek was known as Heliopolis and housed one of the largest and grandest sanctuaries in the empire. One of the most awe-inspiring features of Baalbek is the incredible megalithic foundations of the Temple of Jupiter. The temple was built on a platform of stones that are among the largest building blocks seen in the whole world. 27 of these enormous limestone blocks can be seen at its base and three of them weighing about 1,000 tons each, known as the Trilithon. 
How they were cut so finely and moved into place has defied explanation, particularly considering the blocks are known to have weighed over 1,000 tons. Many researchers, Graham Hancock included, reject the traditional explanation that the blocks are the work of the Romans. A visual study of the blocks clearly shows a difference in style and appearance between the large megalithic stones and the surrounding blocks used to build the temple. The gigantic blocks used in the foundations of the Temple of Jupiter are known to have come from a nearby quarry located about 2,600 feet from the temple. The limestone quarry houses two massive building blocks that never made it to the temple, one weighing about 1,240 tons, and the other, known as the Stone of the Pregnant Woman, weighs about 1,000 tons. It's obvious these stones could not have been moved using the knowledge and technology of the era. Even today, with modern technology and modern machinery, they could not be moved easily. So why create monuments using these huge stones when smaller stones would have been simple? What technology did they use to move these stones and how? Dogu literally means earthen figure. They're small humanoid and animal figurines made during the latter part of the Zhoman period, about 14,000 to 400 BC, of prehistoric Japan. Dogu come exclusively from the Zhoman period and were no longer made in the periods thereafter. There are various styles of Dogu depending on the exhumation area and the time period. According to the National Museum of Japanese History, the total number found throughout Japan is approximately 15,000. Dogu were made across all of Japan except Okinawa. Most of the Dogu have been found in Eastern Japan, and it's rare to find one in Western Japan. The purpose of the Dogu remains unknown. Due in part to the enigmatic nature of the figurines, there have been numerous theories of the nature regarding their ornate appearance, with some speculating that the physical appearance is connected to the suits and equipment of modern-day astronauts. One proponent in particular, Eric von Doniken, has written how the Dogu has modern fastenings and eye apertures on its helmet, an attribution made as part of the final chapter of his 1968 publication, Chariots of the Gods. There are also disparities in the varieties of Dogu, with only a portion of the figures having the characteristic goggle-like eyes, which are most cited by ancient alien theorists. Were these depictions of ancient aliens, or simply fertility figurines? Why did they appear in only one period and then no longer seen? What was their purpose? Who did they represent? The stone doors in Hampi are an impressive pair of monolithic doors that were a part of one of the entrances of the royal enclosure in Hampi. Stone doors are one of the outstanding remnants of the Vijayanagar duration that can be visible around many of the ruins in Hampi. Though the huge doors are no longer connected to any shape and aren't purposeful in any manner, they do not fail to capture the interest of the traffic. The stone doors in Hampi had been a part of the royal enclosure. The enclosure became a fortified area that changed into the middle of the Vijayanagar Empire. Some speculate these doors were not carved, but rather poured 
and molded into shape. What technology was used to create these stone doors? And why use stone when wood would have been lighter and easier to move? Though not ancient, this very old cloth is interesting. The Shroud of Turin is a length of linen cloth bearing the negative image of a man. Some claim the image depicts Jesus of Nazareth, and the fabric is the burial shroud in which he was wrapped after crucifixion. The existence of the shroud was first securely attested to in 1390. The artifact is kept in the Cathedral of Turin in Turin Petamont, northern Italy. The Catholic Church has neither formally endorsed nor rejected the shroud, but in 1958 Pope Pius approved of the image in association with the devotion to the holy face of Jesus. Pope John Paul II called the shroud a mirror of the gospel. Other Christian denominations such as Anglicans and Methodists, have also shown devotion to the Shroud of Turin. Diverse arguments have been made in scientific and popular publications, claiming to prove that the cloth is the authentic burial shroud of Jesus, based on disciplines ranging from chemistry to biology and medical forensics to optical image analysis. In 1988, three radiocarbon dating tests dated a corner piece of the shroud from the Middle Ages between the years 1260 and 1390. Some shroud researchers have challenged the dating, arguing the results were skewed by the introduction of material from the Middle Ages to the portion of the shroud used for radiocarbon dating. The image on the shroud is much clearer in black and white negative first observed in 1898 than its natural sepia color. A variety of methods have been proposed for the formation of the image, but the actual method used has not yet been conclusively identified. The shroud continues to be both intensely studied and controversial. Is this the face of Jesus or a clever forgery? To this day, no one knows what technology could have been used to create it, whether a genuine image of Christ or a forgery. Today, there is an artifact you can clearly see yourself. It's in Antarctica, and some say it depicts the face of an alien. With Google Earth, you can see and zoom in on the face easily. Instagrammer UFO Scandinavia located what many believe to be a massive alien face on the white continent using Google Maps. It's indeed there. Is this pareidolia or an ancient monument of an alien race? Study these images or view them for yourself on Google Earth. Perhaps the most famous and enigmatic crystal skull was allegedly discovered in 1924 by Anna Mitchell Hedges, adopted daughter of British adventurer and popular author F.A. Mitchell Hedges. 
Mitchell Hedges claimed that she found the skull buried under a collapsed altar inside a temple in Lubbeton, in British Honduras, now Belize. The skull is made from a block of clear crystal about the size of a human cranium. The lower jaw is detached. In the early 1970s, it came under the temporary care of freelance art restorer Frank Dorlin, who claimed upon inspecting it that it had been carved with total disregard to the natural crystal axis and without the use of metal tools. Dorlin reported being unable to find any telltale scratch marks except for traces of mechanical grinding on the teeth, and he speculated that it was first chiseled into rough form, probably using diamonds and the finer shaping. Grinding and polishing was accomplished through the use of sand over a period of 150 to 300 years. He said it could be up to 12,000 years old. The skull was examined at Hewlett Packard's Crystal Laboratories in Santa Clara, California, where it was subjected to several tests. The labs determined only that it was not a composite as Dorlin had supposed, but that it was fashioned from a single crystal of quartz. They also established that the lower jaw had been fashioned from the same left-handed growing crystal as the rest of the skull. No investigation was made by Hewlett Packard as to its method of manufacturing or dating. As well as traces of mechanical grinding on the teeth noted by Dorlin, Mayanist archaeologist Norman Hammond reported that the holes, presumed to be intended for support pegs, showed signs of being made by drilling with metal. Anna Mitchell Hedges refused subsequent requests to submit the skull for further scientific testing. The earliest published reference to the skull is in the July 1936 issue of the British anthropological journal Man, where it is described as being in the possession of Sidney Burney, a London art dealer who is said to have owned it since 1933. No mention was made of Mitchell Hedges. F. A. Mitchell Hedges mentioned the skull only briefly in the first edition of his autobiography. He claimed that it is at least 3,600 years old, and according to legend it was used by the high priest of the Maya when he was performing esoteric rites. It is said that when he willed death with the help of the skull, death invariably followed. In a 1970 letter, Anna also stated that she was told by the few remaining Maya that the skull was used by the high priest to will death. For this reason, the artifact is sometimes referred to as the Skull of Doom. Anna Mitchell Hedges toured with the skull from 1967, exhibiting it on a pay-per-view basis. She continued to grant interviews about the artifact until her death. In her last eight years, Anna Mitchell Hedges lived in Chesterton, Indiana with Bill Horman, whom she married in 2002. She died on April 11, 2007. Since that time, the Mitchell Hedges skull has been owned by Horman. He continues to believe in its mythical properties. Who made this skull? How was it made? And for what purpose? To date, no one is absolutely sure. The Nazca Lines are a group of very large geoglyphs formed by depressions or shallow incisions made in the soil of the Nazca Desert in southern Peru. They were created between 500 BC and 500 CE and no one knows their purpose. Most lines run straight across the landscape, but there are also figurative designs of animals and plants made up of lines. Some of the Nazca lines form shapes that are best seen from the air. The shapes are usually made from one continuous line. Because of its isolation and the dry, windless, stable climate of the plateau, the lines have mostly been preserved naturally. As of 2012, the lines are said to have been deteriorating because of an influx of squatters inhabiting the lands. 
The figures vary in complexity. Hundreds are simple lines in geometric shapes. More than 70 are zoomorphic designs of animals, such as a hummingbird. Other shapes include trees and flowers. Scholars differ in interpreting the purpose of the designs, but in general, they ascribe religious significance to them. Who drew these enormous lines that can only be seen and interpreted from the air? Why design what clearly appears to be runways and symbols? Were these guideposts for an alien race or landing areas for some prehistoric civilization now lost to man? It can be hard to resist the allure of a mysterious object found in a context that doesn't seem to make rational sense, suggesting that it's proof of time travelers, lost civilizations, or alien visitors. You don't have to be a conspiracy theorist or a cryptozoologist to marvel at a bizarre computer-like device that dates back to ancient Greece or a 2,000-year-old battery found outside of Baghdad in the 1930s. So-called out-of-place artifacts are often said to baffle scientists and conspiracy theorists. They suggest that scientific efforts to identify their origin and purpose willfully ignore potentially controversial explanations outside the mainstream. After all, it's true enough that science is constantly evolving and we still don't have the answers to many of life's mysteries. But imagine how everyday objects from our own time might be interpreted thousands of years from now if information about how they're used doesn't survive. A lot of artifacts become out of place because their original context might have provided important clues, but the object was moved and that context is lost. When we're so far removed from the original circumstances in which a historical object was created, it's easy to let all sorts of things cloud our conclusions about what those objects represent. How do you explain a sarcophagus lid that appears to show a spaceship, primitive sculptures that look like airplanes, or cave drawings resembling astronauts in spacesuits? Some proponents of the ancient astronaut or ancient alien theories post that intelligent extraterrestrial beings visited Earth thousands of years ago and made contact with humans, potentially influencing their technology. These visitors might have been misinterpreted as gods, the theories muse. The supposed proof of these theories lies in drawings like the petroglyphs of Val Camenisa, Italy, which depict figurines with helmets around their heads that could just as easily be ceremonial headdress or have some other more down-to-earth explanation. Ancient astronaut proponents also cite artifacts like a Mesopotamian cylinder seal that sort of looks like a spaceship since it's just hovering there although the first use of linear perspective wasn't seen in art until the 14th century, so the position of objects on a field in an ancient composition doesn't necessarily mean anything significant, or does it? A 1968 best-selling book by Eric von Doniken interprets imagery on the lid of a stone tube belonging to Pascal the Great, a Mayan ruler who died in the year 683 CE as a depiction of extraterrestrial influence on the ancient Maya. In the center of the frame is a man sitting, bending forward. He has a mask on his nose. He uses his two hands to manipulate some controls, and his left foot is on a kind of pedal with different adjustments. The rear portion is separated from him. He is seated on a complicated chair, and outside of this whole frame, you see a little flame-like exhaust. Or Pascal could be sitting on a pillar in front of a stylized temple, among many other plausible explanations. What all of this shows us is the extent of which wishful thinking can alter our interpretations. 
It's obvious how the helicopter hieroglyphs found in Abydos, Egypt got their name. Those images really do look like modern aircraft. Then there's the Saqqara bird, a sculpture made of sycamore wood discovered during the 1898 excavation of a tomb in Egypt, which dates back to about 200 BC. Some people have suggested that it might be evidence that ancient Egyptians developed the first aircraft many thousands of years ago, possibly with the help of aliens. The Quimbaya artifacts, a collection of tiny golden figurines found in Colombia and dated to around 1000 CE, look a lot like flying objects. When it comes to investigating out-of-place artifacts, the best tool might be Occam's razor, the principle that the simplest explanation is most likely to be correct. The simple explanation for all these objects is that we've taken a lot of inspiration from our airplanes, helicopters, spaceships, and drones from nature, and abstracted birds look a lot like planes. Archaeologists say the Quimbaya artifacts are just highly stylized birds, insects, and amphibians. The function of the Saqqara bird is unknown because very little documentation of the period survives, but no credible evidence of Egyptian aircraft has ever been found. The Klerkdorp's spheres, discovered by miners in South Africa, seemed like they had to be man-made, owing to their supposedly perfect proportions but they're estimated to be 2.8 billion years old. Does that mean that they're evidence of advanced pre-human civilization on Earth, whether some other species from this planet or extraterrestrial? As suggested by Michael Cremo, author of Forbidden Archaeology, The Hidden History of the Human Race. Though they certainly look hand-carved, these spheres are far from perfect and most geologists agree that they were naturally formed as concretions formed in volcanic sediments or ash. The grooves were likely produced due to the very impermeability of the layered sediments in which the stones were formed. When the aforementioned Baghdad battery was discovered in modern Iraq, it was really just three distinct objects, a fired ceramic container, an iron rod, and a bit of rolled sheet copper. An assistant at the National Museum of Iraq at the time thought it looked like a primitive galvanic cell and theorized that it was used for electroplating gold onto silver objects. About a decade later, a man named Willard Gray made a reproduction of the objects, put them together, and filled the vessel with grape juice to prove its conductive properties. To the surprise of pretty much no one, a lot of supposed out-of-place artifacts are just forgeries and hoaxes. When images of a clay object resembling a modern mobile phone emerged online in 2015, along with the explanation that it was discovered during a dig in Austria, eager theorists were quick to declare its obvious evidence of time travel. As it turns out, the Babylon Nokia is a sculpture by German artist Karl Winninger. But what about enduring mysteries like the Antikytherian mechanism, which is believed to be an ancient Greek analog computer used to predict astronomical positions and eclipses? Humans of ancient Greece and roughly concurrent societies might not have had cars, air conditioning, or Wi-Fi, but their technology was often more advanced than many of us imagine. All sorts of things could have been developed, used, and then forgotten as civilizations rose and fell, and so much of that all-important context disappeared over time. Archaeology is a puzzle, and without all the pieces, we're often just guessing, which is why it's important to note that scientific consensus can shift and change too. Few conclusions are fully set in stone. So to speak, we never know when we might receive new information that changes our perceptions.
The popularity of the ancient alien architect theory has grown to great prevalence. This popularity must be mostly attributed to the televised phenomenon of shows such as History Channel's Ancient Aliens. Some sources of information on the topic are found on websites such as TheAncientAlien.com and archaeology books like Graham Hancock's Fingerprints of the Gods and Andrew Collins' Gobeki Tepley, Genesis of the Gods. No matter the popularity of the theory, it is indeed extraordinary. The belief in the ancient alien architect theory defies all bounds of modern scientific knowledge, rejecting traditional accepted requirements for a legitimate scientific theory sometimes. There is no physical or historical proof that provides a definitive evidence to support the theory, and yet it holds. No matter your personal opinion on the theory, it is undeniably rampant, controversial, and extraordinary and it may very well be true. For those who hold stock in the ancient alien architect theory, explanations abound. For example, at the time at which so many of the ancient monuments in question were built, our perception of the necessary technology was not invented. This begs the question as to how our ancestors managed such a feat. Additionally, many of the monuments, Egyptian pyramids, Easter Island heads, etc., have curiously precise alignments with the stars and patterns of the sun. Without telescopes or geometric equipment, this type of precision seems highly unlikely for humans to muster on their own. Interpretations of cave etchings and hieroglyphics seem to reveal images of helicopter-type vehicles and structures reminiscent of a flying saucer. Had our ancestors not been visited by ancient alien architects, how and why would these images appear? Lastly, there is undeniable similarity between structures that were built hundreds and thousands of years and miles apart. Without ever having seen these other locations, how did our ancestors duplicate them? To those who accept the ancient alien architect theory, it seems that the only logical explanation to these mysteries was the visitation of higher intelligence race of aliens. On the other hand, there are many who reject the idea of the ancient alien architect theory. From a technological standpoint, it is true that scientists are still working on figuring out how exactly our ancestors managed such large architectural feats. However, modern discoveries and research has uncovered explanations and theories based in legitimate scientific process. For example, a recent study based out of Egypt led to the discovery that water can be utilized to make the transportation of heavy blocks easier. This sheds light of the question as to how our ancestors managed to move such heavy objects without modern day technology. Circumpolar stars such as Polaris and lines of rope could have been utilized as a method of aligning the buildings so precisely with star patterns. While scientists and archaeologists acknowledge that these actions would have been difficult, they would not have been impossible. Documents and building plans have been found in places such as Egypt as well, describing the large work forces utilized in these projects. For those who reject the theory, they see no actual evidence of its claims. They seek proof in traditional and logical scientific process. Those who believe the ancient alien architect theory are not alone. Believers come from every walk of life, every age and every socio-economic status. There is a social fascination with the topic, and it is widely popular across many platforms. Social media, television shows, blogs, and even support groups devoted to the theory allow believers to hold strong. The prevalence of the show Ancient Aliens undoubtedly attracts many to this theory. Movies like The Day After Tomorrow and Independence Day, while not focused primarily on ancient architects, 
promote fascination with alien conceptualization. All of these platforms make it hard to ignore the topic and allow believers more and more outlets to solidify their convictions. When considering the psychological explanations that may account for belief in such a theory, a few come to mind. Ad ignorantum refers to the idea that something must be true if it's not proven false. And this is key in the mind of a believer. Instead of saying, let me show you proof, they instead say, show me proof this isn't true. Hasty generalization is key as well. Jumping to a conclusion based off insufficient evidence is found in nearly every claim within the ancient alien architect theory. This ties in with the slippery slope ideas as well. A small idea is conjectured and instead of analyzing or trying to disprove it, the idea snowballs into an entire theory. For example, when considering the issue of how the pyramids were built, some argue that hieroglyphics found on site resemble helicopters. A believer assumes this to mean that a helicopter-type vehicle was present, and since humans did not have that kind of technology, they then assume that an extraterrestrial visitor must have brought it. And so if they were present, they must have been helping with the construction of the seemingly impossible pyramid construction. Instead of accepting alternate explanations, a generalized theory is created and seemingly explains the mystery. Now, these psychological explanations account for why so many fall into this belief pattern. It seems nearly impossible to reject an idea when everything seemingly fits. The characteristics of pseudoscience are tricky and can make almost any issue believable. Humans seek explanation and the comfort of understanding. When tackling an issue such as those ancient marvels, it is natural to search for any explanation because it defies what we see as possible. This is where the ancient alien architect theory gains so much attention and how it continues to spread. Just outside Cairo in Giza, the most famous of Egypt's pyramids rise from the desert. Built more than 4,500 years ago, the pyramids of Giza are monumental tombs where ancient queens and pharaohs were buried. But how exactly did the Egyptians build these things? The Great Pyramid is made of millions of precisely hewn stones, weighing at least two tons each. Even with today's cranes and other construction equipment, building a pyramid as big as that of the pharaohs would be a formidable challenge. And then there's the astronomical configuration of the pyramids, which is said to align with the stars in Orion's belt. As well, ancient theorists often point to the fact that these three pyramids are in a way in better shape than others built centuries later. So, are Egypt's pyramids artifacts of aliens? A huge circle of stones, some weighing as much as 50 tons, sits in the English countryside outside Salisbury. Known as Stonehenge, the Neolithic monument inspired Swiss author Eric von Doniken to suggest it was a model of the solar system that also functioned as an alien landing pad. After all, how else could these massive stones have ended up hundreds of miles from their home quarry? No one knows what exactly the meaning of Stonehenge is, but as with all the other sites in this collection, the explanation could be aliens. Instead, scientists have demonstrated it's actually possible to build such a thing using technologies that would have been around 5,000 years ago when the earliest structures at the site were built. But would they know to do it?
It appears as though the stones are aligned with solstices and eclipses, suggesting the Stonehenge builders were at least keeping an eye on the heavens. Teotihuacan, meaning the city of the gods, is a sprawling ancient city in Mexico that's best known for its pyramidal temples and astronomical alignments. Built more than 2,000 years ago, Teotihuacan's age, size, and complexity can make it seem otherworldly. Scientists suspect that over centuries, a mix of cultures, including Maya and Mixtec, built the city that could house more than 100,000 people. With its murals, tools, transportation system, and evidence of advanced agricultural practices, Teotihuacan is often considered much more technologically developed than should have been possible in pre-Aztec Mexico. By far the most well-known of Teotihuacan's buildings is the massive Pyramid of the Sun. One of the largest such constructions in the Western Hemisphere, the pyramid's curious alignment is believed to be based on calendrical cycles. What inspired them to build this? Could it have been an alien intervention? The enigmas surrounding the Moai, Easter Island's fleet of large stone figures, pretty much follows the same narratives as the other sites described here. How in the world did the Rapa Nui make these figures more than 1,000 years ago? And how did the Moai end up on Easter Island? Carved from stone, the nearly 900 human figures are sprinkled along the flanks of the island's extinct volcanoes. The figures average 13 feet tall and weigh 14 tons, and appear to have been chiseled from the soft volcanic tuff found in the Reno Recaro quarry. There, more than 400 statues are still in various states of construction, with some completed figures awaiting transportation to their intended resting place. The reasons for carving the Moai are mysterious, though they are likely sculpted for religious or ritual reasons. It's also not exactly clear what happened to the Stone Age Rapa Nui, but a leading theory suggests their civilization succumbed to an environmental disaster of their own making. Nor do we know who or what inspired these creations. Aliens are also a plausible reason. Outside the old Inca capital of Cusco, a fortress rests in the Peruvian Andes. Built from enormous stones that have been chiseled and stacked together like a jigsaw puzzle. Some say it could be the work of an ancient civilization that had a little help from interstellar friends. The 1,000 year old interlocking fortress walls are made of rocks that weigh as much as 360 tons each and which were carried more than 20 miles before being lifted and fit into place with laser-like precision. How an ancient culture accomplished such a feat of engineering is a little problem to solve. In fact, it isn't the only example of this intricate masonry. Similar walls exist throughout the Incan Empire including one in Cusco where a 12-angled stone has been carefully wedged into place. Did aliens help with or inspire the creation of these monumental structures? It's unlikely the Inca had this technology.
The evolution of technology follows a pretty linear path throughout history, but sometimes we stumble upon artifacts that challenge that perception and throw those perceived timelines for a loop. To some, these out-of-place artifacts are none other than ancient alien technology, providing our ancestors were once visited by an advanced race. While others maintain it's evidence we've underestimated the technological faculties of our ancestors. Growing up, most of us were taught that the Egyptians built the pyramids through primitive means, using simple pulleys and brute force from slave labor. But under deeper scrutiny, this explanation doesn't seem to make sense. And the same could be said about the temple complex at Pumapunku in Bolivia. The temple grounds of Pumapuku are believed to date back to between 536 and 600 AD, constructed by a civilization appearing to have been wiped out by a cataclysmic event. Pumapunku is part of the larger, well-known Tiwanaku site, an important location to the Incas who believe it is the cradle of their civilization characteristics ancient alien theorists might consider significant as well. This area is marked by a decorated megalithic archway known as the Gate of the Sun, and according to Freddy Silvia, it may be one of the oldest temples. Once home to somewhere between 10,000 and 20,000 people, the name itself translates to Navel at the Center, implying it once served as a cultural hub. Atop the Gate of the Sun is a carving, the Supreme God of the Incas. Silvia says the Viracocha and his ilk were described as being much different than the indigenous Incas. They were white-skinned, bearded, fair-headed, and capable of bending the laws of nature. They were also significantly taller. And these weren't descriptions of the conquistadors, they didn't come along for about another century. The reports of Viracocha's superhuman race make the anomalous stonework at Pumapunku all the more interesting. Perfect 90 degree angles, precision cuts, and immaculately even spacing in the stones were shocking considering the primitive epoch in which they were made. Much of this craft stonework remains distinct to this day confounding scientists and archaeologists alike. Earth is probably the last place you'd look for extraterrestrials, especially with all the new exoplanet discoveries and the endless quest to prove there was life on Mars at least once in the past, something billion years ago. But are we looking too far? Some scientists are less out there and more down to Earth, literally when it comes to finding traces of alien life forms. Not that these hypothetical aliens are actually crawling around our planet. What these scientists argue is that they may have dropped by before humans even existed and left behind techno-signatures such as radios, rockets, or other tech that might have been lying deep underground or floating around in space for eons. Astrophysicist John Wright has elicited more than a few eye rolls with a controversial argument that was recently published in the International Journal of Astrobiology. He believes that technosignatures from an alien species that landed not just on Earth or the Moon, but even Mars before its atmosphere was obliterated, or Venus before it became a swirl of toxic clouds, could have possibly survived somewhere. While Venusian clouds and volcanoes would have long since eroded and liquefied any shred of evidence, he still believes it is possible something could be buried on Earth, Mars, or the Moon if it hadn't long ago become space junk. 
If a prior technological, perhaps spacefaring species, ever arose in the solar system, it might have produced artifacts or other techno signatures that have survived to present day. Meaning solar system artifacts provides a potential path to resolving an astrobiology question. Wright doesn't believe aliens actually lived on Earth, and even if they had, erosion and ever-shifting land masses would have turned any trace of them to dust. Hypothetical alien trash would have had a much better chance of surviving in the subsurface of Mars, away from the solar winds and radiation it constantly gets blasted with, and too deep to be smashed by meteorite impacts. The red planet also has no plate tectonics to crush any ancient computers or whatever they might have scattered around. Other scientists are more skeptical, possibly because we haven't yet found any prehistoric ray guns or radio transmitters next to a T-Rex skeleton. Astronomy professor Evi Liob believes that there could have been a visit from other civilizations on Earth. The search for extraterrestrial artifacts is more likely to find techno signatures in space though, however, unlikely that still is. The most effective way to zoom in on something unusual would be a sky survey. Whether we'd actually recognize something as alien, even if we saw it, is an entirely different thought to keep both scientists up at night. Supporters of the drive to find extraterrestrial artifacts are already peering deep into space in a bid to discover cities, satellite networks, or gigantic megastructures. Some even think our own solar system could contain probes sent by an advanced civilization, wreckage from old spaceships, or even evidence of ancient settlements on planets like Mars or Venus. Yet other experts slam this headline, grabbing easily sensationalized discipline as entertainment science and question whether there's any point looking for such tiny needles in the mega haystack of our breathtakingly gigantic universe. A.V. Leo, chair of the Harvard University Astronomy Department, is among the world's most respected astrophysicists. He stunned the scientific community by refusing to rule out the possibility that a strange cigar-shaped object which sped through our solar system may have been alien in origin. Astronomers named the space rock Umaumura, Hawaiian for scout, and said it was an interstellar visitor which formed in another star system before traveling here through the void of deep space. He did not simply dismiss the idea that it was built by an extraterrestrial civilization and suggested it could have been a light cell craft, calling on his fellow scientists to keep an open mind about its origins. What sort of alien technology are astronomers searching for right now? Well, examples include artificial light, industrial pollution, or reflection of starlight from solar cells on the surface of planets around other stars megastructures, or fleets of satellites. Space archaeology with our best telescopes might reveal technological equipment floating in space, similar to the two Voyager probes that we launched and are now leaving the solar system. But we should keep in mind that the travel time is very long between stars. It would take the Voyagers about a hundred thousand years to reach the nearest stars to our sun. The equipment could therefore be defunct if it belongs to a civilization that died by now. The artifacts we're most likely to find include the defunct debris of highly sophisticated technologies, which could be the wreckage of alien spaceships. Perhaps our best way to put our hands on them is to find objects that collide with Earth and survive as meteorites.
Is the truth out there? When astronomers peer out into deep space in search of alien technology, they're often looking for big objects such as a Dyson sphere, a theoretical Death Star style space station built around a star to harvest its energy. A civilization capable of building a Dyson sphere would have to be highly advanced because it would take decades or even centuries to build such a structure. Jason T. Wright, Associate Professor of Astronomy and Astrophysics at Penn State University, became world famous after speculating that the mysterious behavior of a distant sun called Tabby's star was caused by a megastructure moving in front of it although this hypothesis has been dismissed. The idea that we should look scientifically for evidence of alien technology in the solar system goes back to Ronald Bracewell in 1960. Although of course people have speculated about Martians and such for centuries, he said just 100 years ago it was totally reasonable for scientists to discuss the possibility of technological life on Mars. In the 60s, the Mariner probes showed that the Martian surface has no obvious signs of large technology, and so people assumed it, and the rest of the solar system, must not have any sort of technology on it at all. But no one has put scientific numbers to that assumption. How much of the solar system have we checked? Sure, we could rule out the existence of big cities on nearby planets, but what about smaller things? How long would something last on the surface before we would not recognize it as technological? The search for bigger structures out in space requires a different strategy. Finding artifacts outside the solar system is a whole different matter. In that case, we would not be looking at images of things, but perhaps for the heat it gives off, or its shadow as it passes in front of a star. These sorts of artifacts would have to be tremendously huge, bigger than Earth, for us to even notice them. Space is large. So if we find something around a star 1,000 light years away, our radio waves haven't even gotten to them yet. Even if we do ever set up communication, it will be thousands of years between messages, so contact will be pretty limited and slow. However, Wright does believe that if we do find signs of an alien civilization, then it's probably still alive. On a cosmic timescale, things don't tend to last very long after their creators or maintainers go away. So what about the possibility of finding alien probes near the Earth? There's no reason to think that such probes couldn't be constructed, but you would have to build an enormous number of them for us to notice one flying through the solar system. There are hundreds of billions of stars in the galaxy. And if there are artifacts moving among those stars, they will spend most of their time in deep space where no one would ever notice them. For one to just happen to be passing through the solar system around now, there would have to be thousands of trillions of trillions of them throughout the galaxy. But sure, it's possible to build that many machines. If they are what are called von Neumann machines, Johnny von Neumann was a scientist who discussed the implications of building a machine that could build a copy of itself. If you build one of those in space on an asteroid, the idea goes that it would build a copy of itself, then those copies would build copies. Eventually, they'd run out of asteroids altogether and would have to move on to somewhere else. If they could go between stars, then at each star they would turn all the asteroids into more copies. With a scheme like that, you could eventually have enough that would be everywhere. Despite our best efforts, humanity has so far failed to discover even the most basic form of alien life. Dr. Paul Davies, 
a professor at Arizona State University, is author of The Eerie Silence, Searching for Ourselves in the Universe. His book grapples with the Fermi Paradox, an argument which discusses the contradiction between the high likelihood that aliens live somewhere in the universe with humanity's inability to find them, which is often called the Great Silence. He has previously called for a search of the moon to look for traces of aliens, as well as discussing the possible existence of a shadow biosphere on Earth, populated by undiscovered creatures which behave very different to all other known forms of life on our planet. Searching for alien artifacts on the moon is possible. If there was alien technology in the solar system, this is a good place to look because the lunar surface is relatively stable. We search right here on Earth for artifacts in the genomes of terrestrial organisms. This might be as simple as a message uploaded into the DNA sequence of a microbe. Human scientists now do this all the time. Or in the existence of a shadow biosphere, implanted here, say 100 million years ago. However, there is a risk that we might not even recognize alien life or technology if we discovered it. From ancient artifacts to monuments and structures on our planet, as well as others, seem to suggest we are not alone, and mankind has been visited and influenced by extraterrestrials. Perhaps one day we will be able to travel back in time and see where such structures and artifacts came from. But still then, we can only massage the science and try to understand the technologies that once existed, or determine if they were inspired by someone else. We live in a wondrous world, with mysteries and questions all over the globe. But when it comes down to it, the only real question is what do you believe? Did aliens inspire or even create some of the curious structures and artifacts we're continuously finding? Or is it man himself more intellectual than we have ever considered? The answer to our questions may not be in the stars, but rather right here on our own planet Earth. Six, five, four, three, two, one.